Next up, for those of us who are based here or looking to open a business here, they're going to share all the things you need to know about regulation and limitation of blockchain in the UAE. To drive that panel, we've got the expert. He's the founder of Crypto Law Partners. Please put your hands together for Mr. Gordon and Einstein. Cheers, <coughs> Gordon. Thank you. How is everyone? Fantastic. Raise your hand if you're awake. Woo! Raise your hand if you're not awake. Raise your hand if you're not going to raise your hand no matter what I say. Fantastic. That got the biggest response. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Um, I have to admit, I am not a complete expert on uh, UAE regulation. I am a lawyer who's focused on crypto and blockchain globally. I uh, have a U.S. securities law perspective, but we do have a wide and diverse panel today. So let's kind of get them all up here. Uh, Maria Spartalis, my good friend, come on, jo join us. Big round of applause. Maria. Welcome. Fist bump. And then, please. Uh, Tibalt, my friend. Hello, everyone. Big round of applause. Ooh. Fellow attorney. Fantastic. Um, here, I, I, you know what? Let me move my water bottle because it's all about that. Okay, choose a seat, any seat. And then James, please come on up. Oh, you know, I'll take the podium. That's, that's probably a good idea. James, thank you so much. Uh, Bronco, I think you were just up here. Twice in a row, you can't get too much. Bronco, come on, join. And my friend Fernando, where are you? Oh, there he is. Come on, high energy. Woo! I, I know, I just like hearing myself. Are we on? The seat is regulation of blockchain and crypto in the UAE, but obviously we have a diverse international panel here. So yes, we'll be talking about UAE, but also sort of the global schema and how things are developing going through, well, we're almost in the second half of 22, almost, we're getting there. Um, before we dive into the topic, though, I always like to say, you know, every superhero has an origin story, uh, you know, like the Wolverine origin story. Let's find out about our speakers and their backgrounds. I'll just start on this side and keep on going step by step. So, Fernando, name, rank, serial number, and background. What about you, crypto? What's your regulatory point of view? Please. So, uh, I'm Fernando. Um been in this space for quite some years and I've seen it all evolving with many people trying different ways of getting regulation into these new digital assets um, and I, I'm a true believer that regulation is needed urgently you know um, because regulation drives adoption and fast adoption, always. You look back in history, you know, regulation has always helped whatever was taking off to go much faster. You know, if you remember internet, you know, it really took off around 99, 2000 when all the regulations kicked in, you know, and it never stopped. So we are at the stage now with crypto assets, gaming, metaverse, NFTs, everything that is coming that I think we really need to, to accelerate whatever we are doing already around the world. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, my, name is, my name is Maria Spartalis. Uh, uh, actually, uh, this topic is very interesting for me to participate in because I'm a private bank and wealth manager. I was taking care of wealth of private uh, clients, HNV, uh, HNV, in different smaller and bigger banks for 20 years in Austria and Switzerland until I joined a Falcon Bank. It was the first crypto bank in Switzerland to take care also of crypto clients. So um, then I had a chance to compare and to experience uh, this, um, uh, this topic uh, when crypto becomes a kind of part of, uh, of, uh, of the bank and, and uh, you can, you can uh, book it legally in the bank. That's why I will gladly share with you my experience from Switzerland and I'm very happy that now these new laws are moving to Dubai because you have 
uh, a country with uh, incredible potential and very international uh, clients uh, who can use these new laws. Thank you. So you name, rank, serial number, and origin story, if you care to. A little bit about your background. So my, my name is Thibaut, Thibaut Verbeest. I, I'm from Belgium, and I've been uh, involved in, uh, in, the tech, in the tech for about 30 years, first as a lawyer, but also as an entrepreneur. And uh, over the last um, about seven years, my focus has been exclusively now blockchain. And, and crypto, so I, I've advised a number of projects, also worldwide, like, like you, Gordon. Um, and uh, I'm also a science fiction novelist. I see it because uh, it nourishes also my, my work as a lawyer, because I like writing novels that take place in 15 or 20 years. And so, uh, and then I say to myself, okay, that's what I should do now as a lawyer. And, um, and, and I, I recently, if I recently, uh, recently, two years ago, uh, co-founded Payfoot, which is a crypto for football, a metaverse for football. Now, let me ask you a question. In the science fiction novels that you write, are you ever, t and if you're looking forward 15 or 20 years, are you, is any part of those books or novels about regulation in 15 or 20 years? Or is that too exciting? Oh, I, I put cryptocurrency some years ago before anyone was really talking about them when one of my novels, and uh, but we'll see in 15 years. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> okay, uh, my name is James Alcock Harris. I'm from the small but perfectly formed island nation, Pacific island nation of Vanuatu. Am I in the right panel? Hmm? Am I on the right panel? You're on the right uh, panel because so, I say you're on the right um, panel. Anyway, well, here's my story. Two weeks ago, I didn't know my DeFi from my Wi-Fi. Last week, I ditched the suit that I was wearing in the photo. This week, I'm speaking at a Metaverse conference. So next week, probably, I'll be wearing my hat back to front and selling NFT art. But that's my story so far. But it's also, I think, um, emblematic of, of how this industry is growing so very, very fast. And I do have an important uh, story to share today. I am the honorary consul for Vanuatu to the United Kingdom. I'm the CEO of the Vanuatu Investment and Migration Bureau. But perhaps most interestingly for everybody, um, I'm also here representing uh, an island project in Vanuatu called Satoshi Island, which um, is something brand new for us, but it's a real, real life island which is being developed to embrace the crypto community and to bring Vanuatu uh, into the world of uh, blockchain, um, uh, crypto, fintech, etc. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that as sure. we go along. Thank you. Our man from Serbia. Oh, thank you. You remember me. Yeah, of course. So I play football. Hmm? It's enough because well, <laughs> I you already introduce told you. yourself again because <laughs> just, you never know. Just kidding. I'm Branko Krasmanovic, yes, I'm from Serbia. I'm a business developer in IT Center. And uh, I work all, like a uh, consultant for startup companies, regular startup companies. And in previous life, I uh, work with uh, one blockchain accelerator uh, from Slovenia. And uh, in the, this startup life, I evaluate more than 200 uh, startup companies. Fantastic. Uh, Tibold, let me, let me pass it to you. You're a lawyer who operates in this space as well. Are you, I'm just going to put you on the spot a little bit, are you familiar with the intricacies of the different free zones, the MCC and so forth, and the sort of licenses they offer? Have you, have you been running that gauntlet at all? Or do you think it's premature, or do you have any kind of feelings about the developments here? The developments here in the region? Say again? Your question is about the developments here in the region? And specifically in the different free zones and the licenses that they say they have available with crypto. Yeah, I, I, I know that not much about what's going on here because I tried to get some information because there were announcements in, 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 in the past weeks. All I understand is that they are doing something which looks like what we are doing in Europe. 
and uh, with a registration regime and uh, for anti-money laundering, that's what I understand, mm. and uh, with a new authority which would be in place. I'm a little bit surprised they want to create a new authority because uh, don't think it's necessary to have a new authority. Most countries actually go through uh, the existing financial authority, but why not? Mm. But, and, uh, but, you know, it's, I would like to know more about the virtual assets, how they define it, because you know that it's one of the key questions. Is if you want to regulate digital assets, start by defining what a digital asset is, mm. and uh, and you know, and they take also the advantage of a new regulation to define things that we have hard time to define, like NFTs mm. and DeFi. So I would like to know if if they will do like the rest of Europe and the United States. Which, uh, which is already completely obsolete definitions of digital assets, and uh, where they regulate Binance-style businesses, uh, not DeFi, and if they have no clue what that means. So, um, yeah, and, uh, I would like, but based on what we know, mm. everything is in the press, I, I don't know more. Let me ask the audience a question. Who here has an active crypto or blockchain related business now? Raise your hand, please. Or is thinking about one? Or walked into the wrong conference today? Okay. Um, and then who here has attempted to set up a banking relationship while operating a crypto or blockchain business? With or without any success? There you go. So the, the um, I, I think the, I'll just add my two cents here. I think the UAE and specifically Dubai and the different free zones are being very progressive with coming out with new law, engaging consultations, coming out with new forms of business licenses. To, to me, the current challenge is, even if you get your license granted, establishing the proper banking relationship. Because what, what, there is, there's a desire to push into crypto and blockchain on behalf of the country and the different emirates, but there's also the hesitancy of engaging with crypto if you're a bank because you know, you have all your AML, KYC concerns, uh, you have the Financial Action Task Force, you know, listings, and you kind of have to watch your, over your shoulder a little bit and see how your countries can be treated. So there seems to be this sort of dynamic push and pull going back between getting the license from the regulator and then establishing a usable banking relationship that will last over time. So I'm actually going to pass to Maria. Um, you mentioned you're connected with the first crypto bank. Can you talk yes. about that experience a yes, bit? Yes, I would like to share with you my practical experience uh, because uh, some of them, or some of you, many of you maybe have uh, crypto in some, on some exchanges or in some, in some shape. When I joined the crypto bank in Switzerland, uh, I understood the advantage. There are maybe some, let's say, from the first point of view, disadvantages as well, because uh, you have to go through more strict compliance as when you open your account on crypto exchange. And it's like there would be the same uh, compliance uh, requirements as if you open a normal uh, uh, wealth management or some other account. But it's just in crypto, so there are te the, like technologies and KYCs and different uh, procedures which uh, which are the same, but on, also in crypto. But what I found very uh, very positive about this uh, banking, crypto banking, that uh, the customers usually can also keep uh, the assets, crypto assets, on cold custodies. Uh, so they are like in the bank, but uh, you know they are they are not uh, connected to the to the system, and uh, they could not be stolen. So they are secure. It, it it's like black boxes usually in the airplane, but they divided between bank and and customers. So nothing can happen to his uh, crypto assets, and they could, cannot be stolen, which is very big advantage. And if you would like to again connect and immediately convert them to some uh, portfolios or by let's say gold or some uh, conservative uh, investments he can do that At, uh, and it's 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 like a, I, I would say a combination a mutation of uh, all the traditional banking system and the crypto uh, let's say exchange system and of course it will be more uh, more controlled 
and uh, more uh, will require more compliance. But I think that we are all moving uh, anyway to the digital currencies uh, world, and the whole world uh, will might be in some years very transparent. Uh, transparent. And I'm not a predictor, but I have a feeling that uh, we might have, have, uh, uh, have in the future at all one currency in the world. But I hope it will bring not to control maybe of, uh, and, and pressure of countries, but maybe most to some transparency and way to clean money and uh, like a fair division of money in the world. That is my vision and that's, that, that's my experience, but I will very happily answer to all your questions because each, uh, each uh, how do you say, each client has individual requirements and questions. That's why I'm open to answer them and exchange my experience uh, in uh, Switzerland. But I hope in Dubai it will be more advanced and more better because you have already a, a lot of countries who do it. Fantastic. And, and I'll, I'll point out a regulatory uh, commonality, if I might, between Switzerland and the UAE which is they're both essentially confederations. Uh, in Switzerland, you have the cantons, and in the Emirates, UAE, you obviously have the Emirates, and you have a large amount of local control over regulation, which allows a degree of experimentation that you don't see in the United States or Germany or other jurisdictions. It's an interesting balance between the federal layer and sort of the cantonal or Emirates layer. And it's interesting to see how Switzerland's innovating in this department, and it's interesting to see how Abu Dhabi and Dubai are and even Sharjah a bit, are innovating and competing and cooperating with, with the regimes. Uh, Fernando, can you give us a sense of your brushes with regulation? What's been useful, what's not been useful? Is it better just go around it entirely, or what's your life like when it comes to that? Yeah, look, um, people like me, we're just builders. We like to build stuff, we're fast, we, sometimes we're slow because of regulations. I build a platform that took me forever to try to find a ramp off to fiat without scaring people, you know? There's gonna be hundreds of millions flowing through it potentially every month, you know? Uh, so we just build, we go, and you know, you ask forgiveness later, right? I mean, that's what has been going for a long time. But it's not the right way to do it. And with all the stuff that is happening, you know, at the moment, you know, gaming coming, you know, all of these metaverse projects, everybody really wants to go faster, innovate, innovate at a faster pace. But regulators uh, tend to be quite slow, you know, and it's frustrating to a lot of us. All of us want to operate in a framework, in a regulated environment. And this is kind of a scaring a lot of the big players to come in because I think we need all the big players to come in. Uh, and that means that we'll go through a new stage of digital assets, everything that we're creating around digital assets. So for me, I think there's a big disconnect. You're touching a very good point yeah, between banking and regulators, you know? Yeah. And we, I think we need to start to bridge these gaps and very fast and only governments can really push this, yeah? So. I, sometimes I question myself, you know, where's the will in governments to do this? And then I think, well, uh, there is a much bigger thing, is, which is, you know, how do you position yourself in the global, you know. Uh, sorry, just to make sure I heard you, you're asking where's the will, like the willpower. The will get... from governments, because if you look, you, you have to think as well, if you as a government are going to push really hard and get this, you know, what is going to be the reaction of every other country around the world? You, know, you're not, you don't live alone in this world, right? So there's a lot of things that is preventing us from going faster, yeah? And I would love that regulations are tomorrow here and we just, you know, continue what we're doing. But are, are you, let me stay with you for a minute. Are you proposing that if regulation doesn't explicitly, I, I think generally you don't want to do something that's illegal. Of but, but, but if something is not explicitly allowed, but not illegal, are you saying we should wait for the regulators to kind of come around in their own sweet time to do something? Or do we move fast and break things and apologize for it later? So what majority of people have been doing is to actually do that, continue to build, not illegally, obviously, you know, but, you know, continue to build within, the, you know, that gray area. You know, it's a gray area and people don't know what to do. They're afraid of what's coming next, yeah, with all the rest of 
retrospective laws, etc., in certain countries, but people continue to build, and they will continue to build. Yeah, uh, I'm not. I mean, if you, Uber waited for, for permission, we'd all be still taking taxis. Yeah, look, you know? just look, just just two days ago, okay. yesterday, look what happened in UK. Yeah, the FCA is saying if by 31st of March you haven't got a license to operate, you have to cease your operations, yeah? If you're gonna look at s some of you of the, the, the players there, Revolut still has a temporary license. There's quite a few big ones there. So, I mean, what they're going to do? Probably come to Dubai, if there is already a framework, but I doubt it, yeah, but. Well, Binance came down to them, right? So maybe Revolut will too. Maybe, yeah. But, but let, me, let me pass, I wanna hit our two other panelists, but I wanna make a you had a quick comment, no, so I want to get you yeah, in there. As a lawyer, I would like to bounce back, uh, Fernando. It's an interesting conversation. You know, the rule, the rule of law principle says that something which is not explicitly forbidden is legal. And uh, that should be the case in the crypto space. But we can see that there is a real temptation now of regulators to circumvent that principle, clearly, yeah. very clearly. And that's very worrying for the crypto space. And I'm gonna give you one example. It's the, the FATF guidelines on crypto is circumventing or violating that principle by saying, look guys, if you come up with a DeFi platform and that I cannot find someone responsible someone meaning a legal person, individual or a company, liable, responsible for the DeFi, I want to sue someone. So I will actually say that find someone. Find someone or I will actually uh, close, shut down your business. So by default, you are illegal. And, um, and that's just because they don't understand what's going on and they are concerned. So we, we see something which, which is very worrying in terms of rule of law, not in the crypto space. So I'll comment about that, then I'll, I'll pass it to the next two speakers. So, you know, FATF, Financial Action Task Force, just to take your idea, they're, if they're claiming that unless there's a legal person behind a structure, it's illegal and therefore they're gonna shut it down. These people obviously don't understand how blockchain works. I mean, half these, DeFi protocols are just smart contracts like Uniswap that have been published on the blockchain and are now unstoppable. Okay, the company that published Uniswap can't shut down Uniswap even if it wants to. Right? Anyone can publish or fork Uniswap. So the idea that you know it's now illegal and we're you know if we can't see you, we're gonna stop you, I think they have an illusion about what's stoppable on the blockchain. Like you can't stop Bitcoin. Uh, James, I want to bring you into the conversation. We're, we're talking about regulation and, and here you are in sort of like the perfect, maybe isolated micro jurisdiction, but of course, we're all connected now. So Vanuatu and Satoshi Island, tell us about the regulation there, if you know, and then what, what you're grappling with yourself. Right, thank you. And all, all this discussion, debate, dialogue is, is of course very important for us to listen and learn from. Uh, and, and that's the, the importance of forums like this, but also the growth and development of uh, ecosystems such as we're, we're seeing here in, in uh, UAE. Um, I think I owe it to people just to give a little bit of uh, context because most people, I think, believe that Vanuatu is a country in the metaverse, but it actually is a real country as well, I can assure you. Um, 83 islands, it's um, a, an ecologically pristine, uh, crime-free, tax-free future crypto paradise, we hope. Um, so I'm here in the, in the Middle East um, trying to forge uh, connections and, and relationships and to understand what we need to do uh, in Vanuatu. This is a big, bold step for the country. Satoshi Island, uh, if, you, if you do your media searches, you'll find that only yesterday um, a letter came out from the Prime Minister of the company endorsing the island. So the country is trying to get behind the island and, and to become more receptive and open and embrace um, the world of, of blockchain. Uh, it's a very necessary, necessary move for the country. We have a very heavy reliance on a citizenship by investment program, which is very successful, but we've lost all our, our tourism income. Um, and 
with the flexibility of, of the, the crypto blockchain environment, with the agility of the, the capital and the globalization, it's, it's perfect for, for a country like Vanuatu to embrace and capitalize upon. But importantly, not trying to invent the wheel, reinvent the wheel. We, you know, all, the, all the hard yards have been done by organizations such as you know, Crypto Valley, now um, Crypto Oasis here. And um, it, it's, a, it's a brilliant environment for us to learn. Uh, and I, I have to say that the reason I'm, I'm even sitting here today is because you know, I was, it's such an open um, uh, collaborative community as well. And that's, that's what's really helpful. Uh, and my good friend, um, uh, Daniel Montiglioni from Robotica introduced me to Dr. Um, um, Marwan um, Al Zaruni, who introduced me to the, to the law firm who, who are actually architects of the legal framework for, uh, or a large part of it here in the UAE. So I sat down with that law firm and I, I was able to, to understand the, 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 uh, you know, the financial services and the proprietary side to, to the, the way that it's framed, you know, DMC versus DIFC. So I'm now an expert if anybody wants to come and talk to me afterwards, but... Um, well, tell you what, yeah. l l wax poetic for a moment. As an intelligent non-lawyer layperson, what's your understanding of what's available? If you had to do, do like okay. the meta level. Very simply this, uh, I understand the, the um, um, ADGM, Abu Dhabi uh, General Market uh, regulations were formed in two, 2018, uh, they had 300 applications, um, of which four uh, licenses were, were granted. That is the complexity of the regulative framework that they came up with then. Um, and DIFC here in Dubai, similar. It's, it's very complex. And, um, but this is all uh, financial services related, crypto exchanges, uh, cryptocurrency issue, etc. On the other hand, DMCC has emerged um, they already have 300 uh, companies operational, of which I think uh, close to 200 are actually physically present. Um, you know, they're dealing in NFTs and um, um, tokens and uh, wallets, etc. Uh, so in, in Vanuatu now, we need to, to work out you know, what kind of regulatory frameworks we need to, to um, make us not only relevant, um, but also credible as one of the pillars in, around the world, as, uh, in, like in Estonia, UAE, Puerto Rico, et cetera. So, do, yeah. do you think you can do a copy paste of some local Dubai or Abu Dhabi regulations of Vanuatu, or are there local conditions that would require some tweaking or adjustment? Um, if, if, we, if we go down the DMCC route um, and we try and replicate that model, I, I think it'll be relatively straightforward. Um, and, and the good thing about Vanuatu is being a small country um, and, and, and fairly simplistic in terms of the, the layers of, of, of regulations, uh, we, you know, we can adjust and we can adapt uh, according to the advice that we get and, and the relationships that we form. So also I know Slovenia uh, have been very active in, in, in this conference uh, and I'm very eager to forge relationships with, with Slovenia as I am with, with the UAE um, and really to make Vanuatu uh, a South Pacific equivalent of what we're seeing emerge here and uh, Europe and other parts of the world. Interesting. All right, so let's move on to Serbia. Serbia is another interesting case of a sort of mid-sized country that has, I, I would say, elements of regulatory freedom. You know, you're in Europe, but you're not, you know, sort of constrained necessarily by the EU structure. You're a, a bridge between worlds. How are you finding the regulatory environment in Serbia? And where do you take your inspirations from? And then what are you trying to steer clear of? Thank you for that. You're right about everything you said right now. Uh, I'm not an expert like my colleague, but I will say what we do, what, what we're actually doing in the last five years. So uh, five, years ago, five years ago, in Serbia, you can find only five blockchain companies and about 25 developers. Now, in uh, 2022, we have uh, more than 50 blockchain companies and uh, the most blockchain developers per capita in, uh, in, in, the, in the world. So we start five years ago to advocate about the potential of a blockchain. Uh, if we go directly to my town, like Nisha, we explain in the local level what actually we do. We have this idea to have a, 
city token yeah, and to communicate between, between the public institution and the citizen. So first of all, you need to explain the citizen, you need to explain the public institution what the blockchain is. So five, four years ago, our mayor said to the newspapers, the blockchain is the best currency ever. Yeah. So, okay, it is not currency, my friend. So when he said blockchain academy, we start first from this beginning to educate uh, people who actually lead the town and lead the country. Then educate the public institution and ministries who understand what the blockchain like potential can be. We, and we always speaking about the blockchain, not about cryptocurrency, because it's uh, difficult to say this, um, this kind of things uh, publicly and to someone understand you properly. Then when you send the blockchain academy, in Niche, we in 2019 uh, educate more than 30 different uh, blockchain developers and start, start to build our project city and me this usable token in, uh, in the town. But no token who is uh, connected with some finance, uh, uh, VOT and similar things. The token that understands some kind of voucher. So I uh, explained before, uh, you, you, you have some good activities, you generate some, token or say voucher and you can use some other public institution to reduce your cost. And then we uh, uh, collaborate together with uh, Belgrade and other cities and every uh, people, company uh, and institution who actually need to know and want to know what the blockchain is, uh, we advocate to the to ministry and to government. Uh, go to Malta, I think I saw you there some uh, some conference also and collaborate with, with um, Malta government and to see what is, uh, we are not Malta, we are Serbia, of course, and uh, no country can be like Malta. But we can use some good experience and put in the national and Serbian and the local level. So in the end, last year, we adopt a law uh, for digital uh, assets and digital currency. And uh, I will read some uh, chapter from, this is a few sentences, it's okay with you. Mm -hmm. So first of all, uh, we have a, uh, two major points, virtual currency and digital token in the law. But uh, legal entities, entities can now receive cryptocurrencies. Uh, one, is, uh, one way is to charge for services and product and cryptocurrency with retail, and this method does not involve the final receipt of cryptocurrencies, as they must be converted into dinners, that is our currency. Uh, through intermediate exchange offices. And uh, the main point is, um, according to this law, uh, the supervisory body is Serbia with the National Bank and uh, Security Commission. So that's actually be done in the last uh, five years. Amazing. Now, I got the one-minute warning. I, th I think, Maria, I think you had a comment or wanted to add something? I, Yes. I have a general uh, wish to everyone, in, uh, especially to Dubai. I, I think I'm a ve very positive uh, thinker. And I think whatever we have fears, what it will bring us. But I think it will bring Dubai and this area uh, uh, like a lot of more uh, results and uh, like positive development in this area. Uh, and I think uh, we should have no fears. I have a very big expectations from Dubai. It's gonna grow. It's gonna develop in this area, and uh, and it has a lot of uh, future. We're gonna meet us next time, and you're gonna see that it's uh, it's gonna it's gonna be a big success. Fantastic! All right, please big round of applause for our lovely panel. And remember, regulation is fun, or it can be. All right, thank you so much, everyone.